There is a balm in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is a balm in Gilead to in sick soul. There is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. In Gilead to heal the sin sick soul. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my works in vain, but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. in Gilead to make the wounded whole. There is the balm in Gilead to in sick soul. If you cannot preach like Peter, if you cannot pray like Paul, you can tell the love of Jesus. And say he died for all. There is a bond in Gilead to me. Welcome, everyone. We are so delighted to have you with us this evening. My name is Sanford Cloud, and I'm one of the co-chairs of uh, tonight's event, along with Rusty Peter Kelly and dear friend. I'm a former chairman of the board of trustees of what is now Hartford International University for religion 
and Peace, formerly Hartford Seminary. I also received a Master's of Arts degree in Religious Studies there, and I'm a graduate of Black Ministries program. This is a very special place of learning and very dear to me. We are here tonight to celebrate the launch of the Howard Thurman Center for Justice and Transformational Ministry. Both of these new names just ring with great promise. The Howard Thurman Center or HTC is an outgrowth of the 40 year legacy of the Black Ministries program, which will continue under the new center and expand into a national model. We'll be telling you more about that shortly. We have some wonderful videos to share with you tonight, as well as guest speakers who are known both nationally and internationally. But now I'd like to introduce uh, Archbishop Leroy Bailey of First Cathedral in Bloomfield, Connecticut, who will lead us in prayer. May we pray. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, the giver of every good and perfect gift, we are gathered to embrace an icon's legacy, Howard Thurman, who challenged religious and circular bigotry. In his time, he ignited a passion for universal justice. It was his desire also that righteousness would roll down like waters and righteousness as a mighty stream. May this center be a national model of the integration of head and heart and transforming the lives of all who will participate in its programming. May it serve the cause of social justice, empowering leaders to facilitate healing, reconciliation, and peace in our world. I pray this in the name of the Prince of Priests. Amen, Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you so much, Archbishop Bailey, for those deeply meaningful words of prayer. Now I'd like to introduce President Joel N. Lohr, who came to HIU in 2018 and has led us through all these recent changes and through the pandemic with grace and good sense and a tremendous amount of energy and great vision. President Lohr. Thank you so much, Sandy. Uh, honored to be here with you. Thank you, Archbishop Bailey, for your moving prayer. It is a tremendous and immense honor to be here today. Sandy, you are a true friend. You have made HIU a better place through your leadership, through your support, your service. Thank you very much. Um, as mentioned, my name is Joel Lohr. I have the privilege of serving you as president of Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. And on behalf of the board of trustees, the faculty, staff, students, and the thousands of alumni who are around the world, I wanna welcome you to this historic moment, this historic event. Just take a moment, if you could, and look at the chat box. You will see greetings from people around the world. What a privilege to have you here. Thank you. I greet you from the campus of Hartford International, a place that I view as sacred ground. In our 187 year history, we have been so blessed by God, our great provider, to grow the work of peace and to deepen faith throughout our world. I am truly humbled to be here to serve you and to be at this event tonight. And I just want to acknowledge, begin by acknowledging that all we do here is a gift and a blessing from God. I remember so well my interviews to become president at HIU, then Hartford Seminary. Um, who wouldn't? Uh, stressful moment, nerve wracking moments, as you know, when you're interviewing. Uh, one particular moment stands out for me. In my faculty interview, in which you go in front of all 25 faculty, in this case over lunch, I specifically recall one faculty member telling me about the Black Ministries program and how important it is to the institution. 
but the faculty member also shared with me a real need to do more to support it, to welcome its students more fully into the fold, and to capture the amazing energy that our BMP students brought to our campus and, he mentioned, to our graduation ceremonies. I remember in that moment, quietly to myself, I vowed in my heart, by God's grace, I would do everything I could if I was blessed to become president, I would do everything I could to support this program, even though I knew it would take time. Eventually, I got to meet Bishop Dr. Benjamin Watts, the director of the BMP program or the BMP. It was a moment I will not forget. For those of you who have met Ben, you'll meet Ben later today. You'll know that meeting Ben is like encountering a prophet and a loving parent all at the same time. He welcomed me like I was his brother, a brother in faith and a colleague in the work that we would get to do together. But he also shared with me the challenges that he saw for me as new president. I hold that moment sitting on couches just across the road from this campus over here in one of our buildings. I hold that moment very dear in my heart. It affirmed in me the vow I made to support the Black Ministries program and to somehow try to grow it. The idea for the Howard Thurman Center for Justice and Transformational Ministry at HIU has been in the making for nearly 40 years, even if we are only beginning to articulate it now. As we developed our strategic plan, which was approved in March of 2020, I do remember that there were concerns among some of us that our program, the BMP, might, as a result of doubling down on peace building, might somehow be diminished. And I remember trying to share as firmly as I could that this was not the case. This was not my vision. In fact, the opposite was true. It was my hope that this would be a moment to grow it to envision a center that would do more to support students, justice, and ministry. And I knew that this was all bigger than that program, that important program. So I am grateful, I am thankful that so many good people here, trustees, faculty, staff, and especially you, the alumni who are out there today, were able to see and share that vision. Thank you for your patience and thank you for believing in this vision. The legacy of BMP and the tradition of the racial justice work that we have been doing at HIU is astounding. There are so many people I could mention. I just say that I'm mentioning and thinking about people like Bishop Thomas Hoyt, Reverend John Selders, Reverend Henry Brown, Reverend Dr. Shelley Best, Reverend Dr. Elvin Johnson, who's become a dear friend, and of course, former professor and important voice today, Michael Eric Dyson, to name but a few. I could not think of a better way to honor their work, to honor them, than to launch the center that we're launching tonight. In just a moment, we will watch a video about the Howard Thurman Center, featuring the voices of our director, Bishop Ben Watts, as well as several of our wonderful BMP alumni, and the Reverend Tracy Johnson Russell, who has been helping launch the AC. But before we do that, I want to quickly take a moment to acknowledge Howard Thurman's grandchildren, Anton, Vanessa, Emily, Sue Wong, Wong. We are delighted that you are here today to join us. Thank you so much. After the video, we will hear from Dr. Watts, who will introduce our special guests. Please enjoy this video. It was 1982 when Bishop Thomas L. Hoyt Jr. started the Black Ministries program. The late Bishop Hoyt was a remarkable man, senior bishop of the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, a scholar, and a leader in the Christian ecumenical movement. In starting BMP, Bishop Hoyt wanted to build a model for leadership in the urban church. 
And he did just that. Building on the foundation of BMP, this new center will create social change by empowering change agents. Named after Howard Thurman, the famed 20th century mystic, prophet, poet, philosopher, activist, and theologian. The center's North Star will be Thurman's insistence on social justice and responsibility within a spiritual framework. Reverend Tracy Johnson Russell. I recently had the chance to interview several BMP alumni about the idea for a center named after the great scholar and philosopher Howard Thurman. Here's what they said. If anyone knows the story about Howard Thurman, he is the Black church that puts the foundation down. He is the mystic guru of spirituality. My hope is that it will equip church leadership on the issues of mental health. We have a lot of brothers and sisters from all walks of life who are interested in um, social justice and, and mental health and um, whatever falls in, under the, um, the umbrella of um, what's going to be offered and it's going to empower and equip the black church in particular, but all churches in general, to address the social justice issues, not only of our day, but going forward. Howard Thurman is one of the truly extraordinary religious leaders of our time, with the kind of spiritual insights that speak above and beyond the traditional issues of race and culture and dogma. Dr. Thurman has written more than 20 books and numerous pamphlets and articles and has lectured to countless audiences at home and abroad. Diverse colleges and universities have conferred upon him their honorary degrees. Reading your books, listening to your sermons, it is clear that one of the major themes of your testimony to the world has been the idea of the unity of all mankind. How do you go about uh, strengthening that sense of unity? And doesn't it, doesn't it go beyond, uh, beyond just this matter of social uh, unification? Or where do you, where do you get the, where do you draw inspiration for this idea? Relating to all of the, the um, crucial elements in the external world, people and so forth and so on that because you are, you are part of everything and in a sense a part of everybody. And, and yet, so, so that if I, were to, if I were to phrase it in, in a category, it would be something like this, that, that the only way that I can be at home ever is to be sure that I'm at home somewhere. Now, we are on the cusp of a new era. Let's work together to address injustice, to empower those who can make a difference and build a better future for all. The Howard Thurman Center for Justice and Transformational Ministry at Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. I trust that all of you enjoyed the video. Good evening to each one of you. I am so excited that you have joined us here tonight for this great launch event this time where we are celebrating the hard work of faculty, of staff, and of alumni. We're celebrating the continued support of our president, President Joe Lohr, who has masterfully helped to pull together this program and who has worked diligently to show his, that he has been and will be 
a supporter of ministry and programs for our community. I am excited tonight to have the honor, and I do mean the honor, of being able to talk to Dr. Walter, Walter Fluker. Uh, he is, uh, was at the um, Boston University during the same time that Howard Thurman was there. And he was a part of that community and they developed a relationship, a relationship that when person would later become a study focus and he had done some great work there. I wanna mention to you that it is important that we would understand uh, who Howard Thurman is. They both, uh, both Howard Thurman and Walter Fluker were on the faculty there, different times albeit, but they were there on the faculty. But he has a distinct relationship, not just with Howard Thurman, but with the founder of BMP, our founder. And we want to remember him fondly, uh, Bishop Thomas Hoyt, who was a bishop in the Christian Methodist Episcopal Church, had a relationship with Dr. Fluker, which brought him to Harper. And I'm hoping that he'll share more about that. Howard Thurman is a touch, spiritual touchstone for our center. His words will be a part of our North Star and guiding us into work. And with that said, I want to welcome tonight for conversation with us, a preeminent professor, theologian, author of numerous books, and a wonderful man of God. I want to welcome Dr. Fluker. Welcome tonight, my friend. Thank you very, very much, uh, Bishop Watts. I'm delighted to be here. I'm um, so excited about everything. There's only one small correction that I'll make for your wonderful and generous introduction is that I was not at BU when Thurman was there. I'm old, but I'm not quite that old. <laughs> well, I'm glad you said it. I tried to straighten it out and say that you both served on the faculty there at some point at different times. Right. But you're certainly correct with that. Uh, the, but the introduction to Thurman and to uh, a deeper study of Thurman has a Harper connection, which I thought was interesting. Would you share how you got uh, a deeper connection while you were doing your studies at BU? I sure will. And I first wanted to acknowledge President Lohr and his wonderful invitation and to give a shout out to uh, Anton, Suzanne, Emily, Vanessa, and anyone else from the Thurman family that uh, who are present tonight. Um, this has been an interesting journey for me with Howard Thurman. Um, I met Thurman first when I was a chaplain's assistant in the United States Army. Uh, in 1971, I was drafted along with everybody in my neighborhood, <laughs> by the way. <laughs> and uh, I became a chaplain's assistant. And my duty at this chapel was to prepare bulletins for Sunday worship. And lo and behold, each week there was a meditation by Howard Thurman. I did not know who he was. I was a very young man, but I had no idea that uh, years later I would meet him as a student at Garrett Evangelical Theological Seminary in Evanston. And even uh, more so that I would become a part of his extended family. I'm married to Sharon Michelle Watson who is now Sharon Watson Fluker, who uh, was a goddaughter of Howard Washington Thurman and Sue Bailey Thurman. So I wanna make sure you know that for me, this is uh, very close and uh, deep. I did not really get started with Thurman, however, until I entered the PhD program at Boston University. And I was uh, searching for a research topic and much to my surprise, uh, Thurman passed away in April 10, on April 10th, 1981, and his beloved wife, Sue Bailey Thurman, uh, bequeathed his papers to Boston University. And so I had access to all of the papers uh, that had been sent, went to my professor and said, I wanted to do a dissertation on Howard Thurman. And he laughed me out of the room. He said there wasn't enough in Howard Thurman to justify a dissertation. I knew better, but uh, I tell graduate students now, uh, learn to be pragmatic and shrewd with professors. So I ended up doing a dissertation on Thurman and Martin Luther King Jr. on the ideal of community. 
It was in that capacity, searching for some guides and mentors, that I contacted uh, Bishop Hoyt, who was then Professor Hoyt at Hartford Seminary. And he introduced me to the most wonderful mentor uh, anyone could ever have, Dr. Luther E. Smith, who had just completed his dissertation and published the book, Mystic as Prophet. So I do have a contact or context of relation with Bishop Hoyt and his family in those years and was my good friend uh, even until uh, his passings. So that's the context. It, it, it's also, uh, I think that that initial meeting with Luther Smith took place at, uh, at now HIA. At the old Hartford uh, Seminary in Bishop Hoyt's office. And if anyone has ever, anyone knew Bishop Hoyt, you knew that he was a person of incredible intellect, but filled with laughter and jokes. So it was one of the fun funniest moments I've ever had, just being in the office with him and Luther Smith at the same time. But they made an indelible impression, uh, not just upon my work, which I had no idea I was being called into, but uh, upon my 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 person, they they left a stamp, and I think that's what mentors do best. They're able to leave signatures or codes for us that we we spend the rest of our lives trying to follow. Exactly, um, you know, it's it's exciting for us. Um, the alumni committee and several BNP. And we'll, let me just give a shout out to all of the BNP alumni who are online now, uh, upon which we are building this program. A lot of us got together. We had a lot of conversations about the program going forward. And we landed on the name of Howard Thurman, many from different directions and all have been made aware of uh, Dr. Thurman through several classes. Um, and, and it's interesting that we're there, but there are some people who uh, still don't know who Thurman is. So if you had to introduce uh, Dr. Thurman to someone who didn't have an understanding of him, how would you introduce him? I would tell them to uh, look for laughter, look for a light sense of play, because Thurman, like great mystics, the Dalai Lama, Bishop uh, Tutu, uh, uh, if you meet them, they're always laughing because they understand the deep, tragic sense of life. And it's only because uh, of the, their deep sense of the tragic that they're able to look at the world and laugh with it. Thurman had a great saying. He said, don't take life seriously, live it seriously. And there is an ocean and a sea between the two. And so to meet Howard Thurman is to meet not a detached mystic unconcerned about the affairs of the world, but a very earthly human being, a perambulating mystic, Vincent Harding called him, who is always moving, but at the same time laughing himself uh, through the world. And a very powerful laugh that resounds even now. Mm. And maybe in some ways, his teaching us about uh, what some have called the veritable lightness of being may be a pathway into a deeper spirituality, which is wedded to the quest for social justice. Of course, what the Howard Thurman Center for uh, transform for justice and transformational ministry is about how do we find this path in spirituality, which also awakens us to the deep horroring systems of oppression that work against the life chances of human beings. If religion, as the old enslaved Africans used to sing, if the religion is not good religion, then it's no good for every, anybody. So is you got good religion is one of the ways Thurman understood this, not just whether or not you're a good Christian. In fact, sometimes Christianity gets in the way of itself. Uh, 
just to make a remark, when Thurman was with Gandhi in 1936, he asked, at least Sue Bailey Thurman asked the question, what was the greatest hindrance to Christianity in India? And Gandhi, no, the greatest challenge to Jesus in India. And Gandhi replied, Christianity. <laughs> so to understand Thurman is to understand his distinction between the religion of Jesus and the religion about Jesus. They're not the same always. Often they are their worlds apart. And I think part of the challenge at this point in the twin in this 21st century, this third decade of this century, uh, the church has some serious reckoning to do with how it understands the gospel, the good news of Jesus, which is a, a, a message for the poor, for the disenfranchised the left out and left behind peoples of the world. Thurman had already put his finger on it. Really as early as the 30s, uh, he was writing about what we now recognize as Jesus and the Disinherited, which was published in 1949. It's interesting you would select that text. Um, uh, from our inception, there are two professors, from, that's the beginning of BNP, uh, two professors started um, um, with uh, Dr. Hoyt, and that would be Dr. M.T. Winter, who was a wonderful, anointed uh, spiritual woman who was a professor, and uh, Dr. Al Van Johnson, both of which in their teaching uh, have used Jesus and the Disinherited as sort of that seminal foundational book that people have to definitely read uh, to get in touch and it has been, I think, a part of BNP and in, in our works outside of BNP, in our courses, um, in spirituality and other areas. But if there was some other book that you wanted someone to look at, what would, what would be the book that you said you, you need to at least take a peek over here? I always recommend that students certainly read Jesus and the Disinherited, but I never make it the focus of my course. I'm most interested in the ways in which Thurman tells his own story. Thurman's story is like a parabolic journey where he's both participant and observer. He's watching himself <laughs> and he's self-reflective <laughs> as we say. So his, his autobiography is very important. And uh, many of the books that he wrote always include autobiographical uh, accounts. So uh, with head and heart, the second most uh, important book for me was written later in his life. That's in 1971, his book entitled The Search for Common Ground. Here, this is a philosophical treatise that is uh, not for the pain in heart, but uh, excavates the very meaning and fiber of community what is at stake in community and he writes it during the quote unquote decline of the modern civil rights movement of which king and others were a part and the burst of black consciousness so he's trying to tread a very delicate path uh between uh the civil rights movement of which he was a part and this incredible insurgence of black consciousness which has enveloped the globe and he uses an approach as a wise sage would, first of just laying out his own understanding of community, but those last two chapters, I encourage students to pay close attention to because he's really in many ways prophetic. He's looking at what he thinks is coming for America and the world. Yes, yes, that's, that's one of my favorites, I mean, he, he digs deeply there and uh, tries to help us to see the unity of all living things and the commonality that is there to be treasured of all humanity, not just black humanity, but humanity in, in general. Mm -hmm. And then he pushes us to, to search for that light. And, and I think, as you said, very much prophetically so. And, uh, and that's, that's one of my favorites. I, anything else you want to share about that? Yeah, that 
I'm, I'm, I do want to talk about that. I'm also always aware of time in these sessions. So there are two things I must make uh, clear. One is we're engaged now. I'm the editor of the Howard Thurman Papers Project. We published a five volume documentary edition of all of Thurman's writings that were selected out of a corpus of over uh, 59, 58,000 documents, to give you an idea. It was a 20 year project and it's available. Uh, I'm mentioning that because we are also publishing a number of other things like Thurman Sermon Series, which are all available. Or go to Amazon under my name or under Howard Thurman, and you'll find those. But most importantly, this spring at the Candler School of Theology, where I am now as the Dean's Professor of Spirituality, Ethics, and Leadership, we are hosting a conference, a global conference on Howard Thurman. And the title of the conference is entitled The Unfinished Search for Common Ground. And it will bring together some of the most articulate, sophisticated scholars to date, but also social activists and emerging leaders who are concerned about the future of democracy. And of course, Thurman was deeply concerned about the future of democracy, not just here, but abroad. I needed to say that because I'll forget it, because you know, I, though I didn't teach with Thurman at BU, I do have a few miles on me and sometimes I forget. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to close with this and we'll let this be the last question. If, if you were, as we are um, now launching this wonderful center, and as we are celebrating that launch tonight, if you were to say it's something that you hoped and dreamed or even to help challenge us with committing to doing in the center, something you would love if you came back five years from now to see the center to have accomplished, uh, what would it be? And that's not on the list of questions. That's, that's while I have you digging deep. You know, I never read questions anyway, you ought to know that I've just, I, I kind of look at things. I'm convinced that any center that will serve a genuine, authentic purpose at this point in our history, not just our national history, but around the globe, would have at its very center the language you already use, peace and justice. But most importantly, it ought to be a place where you identify, recruit, train and educate a new generation of leaders who are spiritually disciplined, intellectually astute, morally anchored, physically and psychologically whole. If you're not doing that kind of work, uh, it might be a great center, but it might not really matter as it relates to the future of this country and the globe. We need a new generation of leaders to use Thurman language who are willing to run into no trespassing zones of this world system and to deliver a word of hope. The growing edge, uh, my last word. That is the growing edge. Dr. Fluker, you, we picked the right person. You are just phenomenal and thank you so much. I think, you, I it think is, you're phenomenal too. It's been my great honor to talk to you tonight and I hope it's not our last time and I hope you come back and what you see is exactly what you were thinking of because that is the direction we hope to go. And so and thank meant, you again. And I meant to give a shout out to my sister, uh, Dr. Beverly Tatum, who is also one of those folks who are part of this growing edge. I'm waiting to hear from her. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you again. God bless you. We appreciate you tonight. Next, yeah. I'd like to take the time to introduce a short video of uh, from Ambassador Andrew Young. He's a proud graduate of Harvard International University in 1955. And as many of you know, a civil rights icon who was a close advisor to Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. Ambassador Young was also a Congressman, a mayor of Atlanta, as well as a US representative to the United States. Ambassador Young speaks to the why of his coming to Harvard International University. Then of course, Harvard Seminary with its international outlook and focus on peace and had such an impact on him and others working 
for social and racial justice. Let's hear now from Ambassador Young. thing about Hartford for me was that it was a global student body and faculty. Uh, I think we had just about every continent uh, represented in the student body. And we had missionaries that had gone to other places where we didn't have uh, uh, original students from the original country. Uh, but it was an atmosphere that uh, made the world make sense to me. I always thought of myself as a pastor. As a pastor, I went where I was called. I was called to the National Council of Churches. Uh, and the irony of it was, I was called to work with white students, helping them to get ready for integration. Uh, but then I left there and went to work with Martin Luther King and stayed there for the next 10 years, lived through the civil rights movement. It's hard to replace that part of my life. The weekend before uh, he went to Memphis, we had a conversation talking about how to get the energy of the movement into politics. Uh, I never thought we were talking about me, but when Dr. King was killed, it was not long after John Kennedy being killed. Robert Kennedy was killed shortly after that. Malcolm X had been killed. Uh, it wasn't very encouraging back in those days. And so everybody who was talking about running backed out, and I ended up running for Congress, losing the first time, getting elected the second time. That led me to working with Jimmy Carter as governor. Um, and then I ended up supporting him for presidency. And he asked me to go to the United Nations. President Carter led the prolonged applause in the White House East Room for the swearing in of Andrew Young to be the new US ambassador to the United Nations. After heaping praise on the 44 year old ordained minister, civil rights leader, and former Georgia congressman, the president stepped aside so that Associate Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall could do the honors. Then, referring to the voting rights struggles when he was an aide to the late Martin Luther King, Young quoted the words of the hymn, Amazing Grace, to express his appreciation. The new ambassador leaves early next week for a 10-day trip to Africa on a fact-finding mission. Hartford provided me with just enough uh, conflict in my life to make me grow and to make me want to grow. Uh, both my New Testament professor and my Old Testament professor were, um, were Quakers. Uh, and so there was a strong Quaker influence that meant a strong nonviolent influence on the, on the campus. And it meant that I would go to the Quaker meetings quite a bit. Uh, because that was something new. I found that it was what I needed. And I was there for three years. And that gave me a very, very proper background. I want to thank Ambassador Young for those moving words. I am proud to be at a place that has just enough conflict uh, to grow and to help us grow. Um, for those of you who do this work, for you who are involved with what we do here at what's, what was Hartford Seminary, now Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, you know that this work is hard work. Um, I will say it is with fear and trembling. And also laughter at times, which I'm thankful, uh, Dr. Fluker, you've reminded us of tonight in your words about Thurman. 
but it's with fear and trembling uh, that we put those words in our name and that we recognize uh, the importance of justice, of peace. And um, conflict often helps us grow. And I like that uh, language that Ambassador Young used tonight. Thank you, Andy. You are an icon of IKU, uh, HIU. I'm just privileged to know you. I have fond memories of looking over the city of Atlanta with you and looking at the city that you helped build and did so much to help flourish. Thank you. We have another distinguished alum who is joining us live and who has also made an enormous impact on how racial justice is viewed in this country, indeed around the world. Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum is a national and international leader in both higher education and racial justice work. She is president emerita of Spelman College, and she is also the author of a best-selling book, which you need to buy if you don't already have, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria and Other Conversations About Race. The 20th anniversary of that book, a new edition had come out, has come out recently. Also, I would note an international edition. I remember contacting Beverly recently and she said that international edition has come out and she was touring and being part of the release of that. Beverly's credentials and honors are far too many to mention tonight. Please look them up and learn more about Beverly, but let me say two things quickly. Beverly graduated in 2000 from HIU, then Hartford Seminary with an MA in religious studies. But also important to me is that she is an incredibly down to earth, kind, loving and generous soul. She's someone who has welcomed me into her home in Atlanta with her husband, Travis and other guests. She has made me feel welcome in this country and taught me things about the United States as a Canadian that I deeply value. And I'm just so immensely proud that she is a member of our alumni and a friend to me. And so with that, that, welcome, Dr. Tatum. Welcome, Beverly. Hi. Hi, Joel. And thank you so much for your kind words. This has just been such a wonderful program. I'm honored to be part of it. I, I'm so pleased you're here. Uh, so many people are eager to hear from you. You're a bit of a hero around here. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure that embarrasses you, but it's it's true. Um, we have lots to talk about. I'm, I would love for people to hear a little bit about your story. Um, way back, well, way back, back in 1993. Way back, <laughs> yes. <laughs> a little while back, um, in the midst of your busy career as a professor of psychology, and then you became dean at Mount Holyoke College, um, you already had a PhD. What drove you, what kind of madness, uh, you know, in that busy time? Having a PhD, what would drive you to go study here at HIU, then Hartford Seminary? Uh, what, what, what was it? What happened? Well, it's a great question and a long story, but I'm going to give you the short version, which is that um, the year before, 1991, 92, that academic year, I was on sabbatical. And during that sabbatical year, I had the wonderful experience. I actually had a deeply personal spiritual experience, which led me to um, enter a dialogue with my then pastor, who is also a Hartford alum, uh, Reverend Dr. Ed Harding. And um, Reverend Harding and I began having conversations about theological questions. You know, what did the Bible really mean when it said slaves obey your masters? What did it really mean when it said women shouldn't speak in the church? You know, these were conversations that we were having. And during that time when I had so much time being on sabbatical to read and think and have theological conversations with my pastor, it was a, it was a luxury. But fast forward a year later, I was back in the classroom teaching really wanting more of those conversations. And um, Ed, Reverend Harding said to me, you know, you, you have questions and the level at which you're reading and asking questions, you know, maybe you need another environment in which to explore some of these questions. I have a friend at Hartford Seminary um, who, who happens to be the director of admissions there. I think you ought to go have a chat with her. 
And so I went to see then, um, the then D director of admissions was um, Reverend Dr. Barbara Headley. And I sat with her and she gave me a copy of the catalog. I took it home and I read these descriptions of all these wonderful courses that were available at Hartford Seminary. And the one that was most striking to me and perhaps the most important one of all the ones that I took was something called the ministry seminar. The ministry seminar was all about integrating one's spiritual life with one's vocation, whatever that might be, and really expanded my understanding of the word ministry. You know, my friends would say, oh, are you, do you wanna be a minister? What I learned at Hartford Seminary in, that early, in those early days was that the answer to that question was not, yes, I wanna be a minister. The question really was, what is my ministry? And that that was um, something I really wanted to explore. And I came to understand my teaching and my uh, educate, the, my social justice education that I was doing around racism was really my ministry. And that um, first course, that ministry seminar led to another, led to another. I didn't really plan to get another degree, but mm -hmm. I so enjoyed the courses that I just kept going. And I, I'm very proud of that master's degree in religious studies that I earned at Hartford Seminary, now known as Hartford National University for Religion and Wow. Uh, we actually share some things in common, and I didn't realize fully that around the time you were having your conversations with your pastor and I was having conversations with my pastor, I sometimes think pastors want to, maybe they, they don't know how to handle people like us. I, I was, for some odd reason, and it seems even more odd now, but I was reading Kelvin's Institutes as a, as a young you know adult, um, interested in the questions around Reformed theology, because I just grew up with it, maybe too much of it, and I wanted to understand Kelvin, and I remember him saying, why are you reading Calvin? I mean, we. Have to read the your idea, idea of um, <laughs> are you going to be a minister? What is your ministry? We all have ministry, we all have a calling. God is calling us all to something. What is it? And to discern that call is really important. Thank you. Um, I'd love to hear from you. Um, having spent some time here, you've said a little bit, maybe a touch more. What, what is distinctive about this place? What are some unique features about what we now call HIU, Hartford International University for Religion and Peace? What I found very important and distinctive was that I was in classrooms with other people who were asking similar questions, but from very different backgrounds. So um, it was, as uh, Ambassador Young said, it was global. You know, there was international students. It was certainly interdenominational, not just within the Christian tradition, but certainly beyond that in terms of interfaith um, and having the opportunity to learn from folks whose tradition was very different from my own, whether that was um, because they were Jewish or Muslim or some denominational experience that was different from my mainstream uh, UCC upbringing. And um, so that was important. But, but as I said, you know, because I knew I, I, I was not pursuing the idea of becoming an ordained clergy person. You know, I wasn't thinking I was going to leave my career in higher education and become pastor of somebody's church. That was not what I was imagining. And I appreciated that I was surrounded by people who some of whom wanted, who were, you know, were clergy people and were deepening their theological um, understandings. But in my program, in that master's degree in religious studies program, most of the people, if not all, were lay people who like me had questions of how did you discern, how did you think about your vocational activity as ministry, as a calling? And what difference does it make when you think of it in that way? And so being um, around folks who had very different experiences but similar questions was very inspiring for me, a very rich learning environment. And I want to say one of my favorite courses, because I heard his name invoked earlier, was the course I took with Bishop Thomas Hoyt. Mm -hmm. 
mm. the rich and poor in the Gospel of Luke. I remember that as being really a very transformative class. We had great discussions and I think of uh, Bishop Hoyt very fondly. Mm. That's interesting. Just quickly on that, I found some of the courses that most blessed me and challenged me were the courses you might think, like not, not that Luke isn't important, but it's, it's a very specific focus. And sometimes focusing on something really intently, even if it's not your major focus in life, can really be a great distraction and help you think more freely and openly about other things. Or go to a conference and take in a workshop that's totally different than what you're studying, and you're going to learn something that's going to help bring perspective. Um, I'm going to publicly, full disclosure here, presidents lean on other people and especially other presidents. Um, Beverly, you've been a dear friend to me. Uh, there are other people out there like you who have helped me in my leadership. It's only on the shoulders of others that we stand. Uh, I have contacted you in the past with questions about Howard Thurman Center, about even our new name change, um, which has been a big you know, big shift for us, really exciting, powerful, amazing to hear the, the positive response, which I didn't fully anticipate. So Hartford International University for Religion and Peace. What about our new, new name excites you, captures hope uh, for our world? What would you, anything to say about that? Well, let me just say that what I like most about the new name is how descriptive it is. You know, it tells you right away that Hartford is an international, a global institution. You know, it's, lots of people will tell you that, you know, we are global in our mission. You know, lots of higher ed institutions certainly want to be global. But literally, I met people from all over the world in my classes. It is an international organization in that sense. So I really, that's an important adjective. Um, University for Religion. Well, when you think of a seminary, it is a place where you go to study religion. So, and that core value is still there, right? We're there to study um, theological ideas from different vantage points, different faith traditions, but still the exploration of religion. But for religion and peace, I think is so important because if there's one thing that Hartford Seminary was known for, it was its interfaith tradition, it's interfaith opportunities, it's Muslim Christian programs, it's, you know, that interfaith um, uh, value was core to the institution known as Hartford Seminary. And when we say Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, it lets you know that religion, which can be a source of conflict, is not that in the context of HIU, it is in this pursuit of peace. Um, I know we're gonna talk about Howard Thurman in a minute, but I just wanna say that one of my favorite Howard Thurman quotes is about what is referenced sometimes as the dream of God. Mm -hmm. And that quote is, a friendly world, a friendly folk beneath a friendly sky. Mm -hmm. And if you think about um, Hartford, International University for Religion and Peace, I think that describes what HIU is trying to create, a friendly world full of friendly folk under a friendly sky um, that we can all share as uh, in that search for common ground that Dr. Fluker was talking about. I, I could not agree more. And my colleagues and others will know I regularly say, um, yes, uh, Hans Kuhn, the, the Swiss theologian, is right that there will be no peace in our world without peace among the religion, and there'll be no peace among the religions until there's dialogue among the religions. It's a quote we use often here. One of our alums last year at graduation said, yes, but there will be no dialogue among the religions until there are friendships between the religions. Mm -hmm. I would say that's kind of, you know, if you want HIU secret sauce, it's the friendships that are formed in this place that help us learn how to talk to each other and learn to value each other and to see the humanity in our in our human family or the the, the family that we are um, thank you for that uh, question now maybe turn a little bit to the work of the center um, what might you say about our work to support black leaders and ministers through the howard thurman center why is this work important i mean you could talk about this for a day um, given what you've what you've written, do, what might you share? 
Sure. Well, I think if we understand the center as being um, a wellspring for the Black Ministries program, what that lets us know, reminds us, is how important um, Black urban ministry is. Um, and I say urban ministry, I mean, some Black ministry is not urban, it might be rural, it, you know, suburban, et cetera. But when I think of the BMP program, I think of it as an urban focus. Um, but whether urban or not, what we know is that within um, Black communities, so much leadership comes from the Black church, right? You know, it's a, it's a fountain of leadership development. And yet my experience at Hartford when I was there, um, I wasn't part of the BMP program, but I had colleagues, you know, classmates who were in the BMP program. And what was clear to me was that Hartford was providing a rich opportunity not easily found elsewhere to deepen one's knowledge of whether that was biblical texts or other um, theological ideas, you know, to it was provide it was a kind of professional development that was restorative and regenerative. You know, when I think about um, the hard work that those of us who are laboring in the fields, whatever those fields might be, um, are doing, you know, it, it can be draining, right? Uh, um, my good friend, Reverend Harding said to me once, if you make a lot of withdrawals, you better make a lot of deposits. <laughs> and anyone who is leading in the context of urban ministry must be making a lot of withdrawals because there's so much need. You know, people are looking to you for leadership. People are looking to you for support. People are looking to you for guidance. Um, you're giving, giving, giving. You know, that was my observation. And, and certainly those folks that I know in that situation are giving all the time. And when you're giving that much, you need something to give to you, right? You need to make some deposits. And um, it seems to me that the Howard Thurman Center, particularly if we think about the um, contemplative example that Howard Thurman provides, it seems to me is going to be a very important well for, from which people will be able to drink and refill their tanks to, in order to go out and give some more. Thank you. Um, maybe one or two more little questions here. One that you've already mentioned something about Howard Thurman. Um, and you recall, I think I contacted you early as we were sort of exploring ideas for the center. I asked you privately, you know, what do you, Howard Thurman, what do you think of the name of, of moving in that direction? Um, wouldn't be the first center with his name. What were your thoughts on this? Would you, what are some thoughts on Howard Thurman about our centered name? And also, uh, you've already said this, but anything else you'd like to say, or say about Dr. Thurman's uh, impact on your own life, faith, understanding? Sure. Well, I think when we were having that conversation and, and you were raising the question of, you know, it won't be the first center, um, I made reference to the fact that, you know, there are plenty of things with Martin Luther King's name on it, right? You didn't have to have the first to have it be meaningful. And, uh, and certainly I think in the context of the work that HIU does, you know, thinking about the um, interdenominational work, thinking mm. about, you know, sort of the fellowship um, of all believers, regardless of the diversity of belief, right? But the, that fellowship that comes um, in that context it seems like the perfect name for what is trying to be accomplished. But for me in particular, you know, I am not like my dear friend, Walter Fluker. I am not a Howard Thurman scholar, but I have read the autobiography and I have some of his other books on my shelf and, and regularly look to them when I'm wanting to, for um, something to meditate on. You know, if I'm looking for something meditative to think about. I find his writing, his meditations of the heart um, to be a very important fountain of wisdom. And I say that to say that my own experience of my spirituality going back to my early days in Hartford Seminary 
um, now HIU, um, have a lot to do with silence. You know, I, um, my most important uh, spiritual experiences have happened for me in silence. And I really appreciate the ways in which Howard Thurman talks about the importance of silence. And I will share with you just something meaningful. I was not here at Spelman College as president when um, this happened, but when I came to serve as president in 2002, there was a long serving employee at the college who would often tell me about the sermon that Howard Thurman gave at Spelman titled The Sound of the Genuine. And she made reference to it regularly. And I so wish I had been there because that, that idea of the sound of the genuine and needing to find that within yourself, for me has been um, an idea that really resonates in terms of my own experience of my spirituality. And so I am wishing I had taken a Howard Thurman course <laughs> at HIU and, and Walter, okay. maybe I'll get to go to your conference, but I know that, um, the mystical elements of his um, his writing has been very meaningful to me. In, in learning more about the laughter piece tonight, um, my daughter, this is an, I'll end on, well, I'll ask you one more little thing, but um, I still remember early in my daughter's life, I was, uh, we were trying to in, instill some values or just even little Bible verses and um, the Shema in Judaism and in Christianity is, is this idea that hero is real, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and love your neighbors yourself. And so we would say this often to our daughter. And at one point, just out of the blue, I said, Abby, you know, or my daughter, what, you know, what's the most important thing in life? What do you think God most wants us to do? And I'm hoping she's going to recite the Shema, the this, this, this saying to us back. And yeah. So I said, what's the most important thing you, that God, we should do that you think God wants us to do? And she looked up at me and she said, laugh. <laughs> and I thought, yes, that's, that's, yes. Good. that's good. Don't lose that. The Shema is important too, but laugh is good. Um, so I'm, I'm just delighted to hear that Howard Thurman and I share a lot in common on that. Um, anything else? You, we had almost 200 people here at one point. I think there may still be nearly that. Anything you'd like to share with our audience today more? Well, I just want to express gratitude. You know, I, um, as you pointed out, when I came to Hartford, I already had a PhD. I'd been, in, you know, I'd experienced a lot of education, but I often tell people that my experience at Hartford was one of my favorite educational experiences. In some ways, you know, I was, um, it was 1993. I was in my late thirties when I started and I, went because there was something I really wanted to learn, not because there was anything I had to do. I didn't need a credential. I didn't need a license. You know, I didn't need it for the next career move, but it certainly enriched my life in many ways. And I will say that the interfaith um, understanding that I took from Hartford Seminary, now Hartford International University for Religion and Peace, was very, very helpful to me when I got to Spelman and found that we were very much an interfaith community, that there were Christian students and Muslim students and Baha'i students and students from various traditions. And that experience of engaging with people whose faith traditions was different from my own, I think helped me very much as a leader in a multi-faith community. Thank you so, so much. Always a pleasure to talk to you and to do so with a large group around us is a real privilege. Thank you, uh, Dr. Tatum. Uh, I would like to bring back Bishop Dr. Ben, Benjamin Watts, my friend Ben, uh, to share a little bit about his vision for the Howard Thurman Center. Ben. Thank you so much, President Lohr. I can't tell you how excited I am tonight for this wonderful experience. This has been a beautiful moment. I wanna make sure that I give uh, some thought to what I'm going to say. And I want you to realize that today is the culmination of work done by so many people. I'm excited, my colleague and friend, Dr. M.T. Winter, 
who pushed me and talked to me about how the fact that she felt in her heart of hearts that BMP program needed to be encouraged and strengthened and that she really thought that a center was more appropriate going forward. I'm so excited about how President Lohr took this project on and really understood what we needed, assigning both one of my wonderful colleagues who's on sabbatical now, Dr. Dina Grant and his own administrative assistant, uh, my dear sister Lorraine Brown, to work with me as we began to explore this idea. And we began to pull together alumni and the Alumni Association for BMP, shout out to all of you online. I know you're all listening and you will hear this later. They came together and we began to enter into dialogue. I look back a few minutes ago at a note that I wrote to President Lohr about the vision that we shared, not my vision, but a vision of our BMP community of what we thought could be the future. I wrote back making sure he knew that I appreciated the efforts and support of those persons he had put around us. But then I wanted him to understand this all important aspect. And that is the fact that we had ad hoc committees that sat by around and studied and pulled together ideas. And when they came out with their ideas, as we talked together, we came up with this name, the Howard Thurman Center. Now, once we got to that name, we added words like justice and ministry, and ultimately we've come down to transformational ministry. But there were five areas of interest that we were concerned about. And that was to continue the work of BMP as it existed. And that is the work of training and equipping lay and those who were going to be in the pulpit with theological education. That was the foundation upon which we wanted to build the continued work that Bishop Hoyt knew was necessary to go forward there. But then we wanted to move in and add areas like public leadership. In other words, how do we help communities to engage and be empowered? How do we help people to learn to do and to be participants in civil society? Health and wellness, which for us meant understanding trauma as it has entered into our lives and in some cases into our very DNA and ask the question of how do we help people dealing with trauma in life and how do we produce persons empowered to work with others? And then how do we do youth empowerment or shall I say engagement? Because see, at some point, those of us of faith have to find ways to continually engage with other persons and particularly our youth who seem to be falling away from our worship centers. We thought very closely that we could engage people and empower the community in the urban setting and people in general by having things like a leadership institute that we thought we could do in honor of the name of John Lewis and that good trouble. We thought of ways we could be involved in civil rights and in social justice and in politics and in helping with diversity and inclusion and being sure that we could train leaders and advocates who would work to transform criminal justice systems and would make this country a better place to live that was anti-racist, that was there, that not only would be there, but would make a difference, that would consider the issues around ableism and ageism and sexism and the LBTQIA community. We thought that it was our job to think outside of the box and who better than Howard Thurman to sit and be our North Star? What better individual could we find? Somebody who could speak to the times, someone who understood the times. The quote that draws, draws in tonight is a quote that comes from the footprints of a dream, the story of the church for, for the fellowship of all people. In that footprints of a dream, at the very earliest moment, written in 1959 on page seven, Thurman has these words. The movement of the spirit of God 
in the hearts of men and women often calls for them to act against the spirit of their times or causes them to anticipate a spirit which is yet in the making. In a, mo in a moment of dedication, they are given wisdom and courage to dare a deed that challenges and to kindle a hope that inspires. Tonight, I'm glad that you joined us to recognize that we are daring deeds that challenge. We are meeting the challenge and have tried to meet the challenge in this early stage. We're proud of the 40 year legacy. We're proud of Howard Thurman. We're proud of our founder, Bishop Thomas Hoyt. We are excited that we have colleagues and ministries who have supported us around for a long time. But we know we can do better training. We know we can help more pastors to move towards ordination. We know we can engage our young people in deeper, more meaningful ways and train leaders and Christian education directors to engage our young people. We know that we can help to work in collaboration with others. This is a historic moment. Our gratitude to President Lohr is beyond bounds. And in this historic moment, our gratitude for those of you who have joined us knows no end. Right now, the church and the black church in particular must find ways not only to engage, but in some cases we must re-engage in this contemporary struggle. I hope that you will join us in supporting the work that we're already doing. And I'm excited to have my newfound friend, uh, Brother Peter Kelly, who is my Luke 10 colleague and brother who has worked with us and has been a part of my journey of late as I seek other ways to be supportive to other communities. I'm learning that the beloved community means loving and being a part of something special. Tonight, I hope you feel like you've been a part of something special. And I hope you recognize that the faculty, the trustees, the board members, every visionary that has joined us have made a commitment to make Harvard Seminary not only a regional place for BMP, but a national model, because we're taking our program national. And what people have been getting over the 40 years locally, we hope to bring collectively to a wider audience. And we also hope to bring them to our campus here at HIU for the HIU experience that they can recognize that together we can make this world a better place. I wanna leave you with one last quote from Howard Thurman. He says in the living wisdom of Howard Thurman, a visionary for our times, he says, <laughs> don't ask what the world needs. Ask what makes you come alive and go do it. Because what the world needs is people who have come alive. I hope that those of you who have come alive will recognize that it's our time to help others not only come alive, but live their best life and their best life of faith. Thank you so much. With that, I'll turn it over to my dear friend and brother, Peter Kelly. <laughs> Thank you so much, Bishop. Uh, uh, you're a tough act to follow, to be sure. A uh, very special guy uh, in all of the ways you work. Uh, it's a privilege to work with you, frankly, over these uh, last years. So let me say hello to all the panelists and our audience at home. I want to thank everyone who has participated tonight and enlightened all of us on Howard Thurman's remarkable life and how it will guide this new center. It's an honor to be uh, here as a, one of the co-chairs of this event, together with my good and long friend, long-term friend, Sandy Plowd. So as you can imagine, having this center uh, gives us the opportunity to reach new audiences. Uh, but it's also a natural fit because of the 40 year legacy of the Black Ministries program, a superbly effective program that's enriched the knowledge and spirit of more than a half a dozen friends of mine. Uh, and frankly, I didn't know Sandy Cloud had had this experience. So I would add him to that list. I'm thrilled to be able to tell you that 
in December, HIU received word that uh, the Lilly Endowment has granted a, a $1 million grant to be paid over five years to expand the Black Ministries program into a national initiative. The grant will allow us to establish a pastoral and academic research center, bring a Black church scholar to campus, and ensure a little bit like Yale that no student is excluded because of inability to pay. The Howard Sermon Th Th Center, which will uh, administer the Black Ministries program, is actually a $2 million initiative. So this grant funding gets us halfway to our goal for the center. We hope you will consider a gift that will help us reach that goal, however big or small, and expand our ability to address the social issues so critical to our nation's future. The year 2020 was an, 2021 was an extraordinary experience when America uh, arose and with understanding of uh, the need for racial justice. Uh, the leads of that can be the leaders that come out of uh, the, uh, the, this new center. There's so much po potential here to offer courses and workshops and conferences that build on long overdue national reckoning that, as I said, came in 2020. I urge you to support us in that effort. And now I, I'm delighted to return the program to President Lohr, uh, an extraordinary leader. We, uh, I, I, I met him when he was very early on and thought, my goodness, this poor guy, what a job he's got. But boy, what a job he's done. Thank you. Thank you, President Thank Moore. Thank you so much. I will close out by thanking you, Peter, thanking all of our participants. So much appreciation for all of you, Ambassador Young, Dr. Fluker, Dr. Tatum. Uh, so honored that you're with us. To Sandy and to Peter, thank you for being our co-hosts and the work that you do behind the scenes, which is not going necessarily noticed right now, but I want everyone to know that they are dear supporters. Uh, I'd like to thank Archbishop Bailey for leading us in prayer, Reverend Wayne Dixon for the beautiful music that you provided at the beginning of the program and more that will follow at the end in just a moment. I need to thank uh, Dr. Watts, Ben, Reverend Tracy Johnson Russell for helping us launch this, the staff who worked hard behind the scenes. I want to thank those BMP students who we have been thanking and I want to thank again for everything that you've done. For those who gave their time to the video and supported that, thank you for that. I'd also like to recognize another guest here tonight, uh, former President Mike Ryan. I know you're there. Thank you for being here and continuing to sort support our initiatives, our new name and me as president. At this point, we're gonna put up a slide. I just need to name a few donors. We wanna recognize those who have supported Black Ministries program over so many years. We do this as a thank you. There are too many to name aloud. I just wanna call out a few of them. Peter mentioned the Lilly Endowment, that million dollar gift that will support our initiative. Thank you. Asylum Hill Congregational Church, thank you. Hartford Foundation for Public Giving, thank you. Uh, J. Walton Bizzle Foundation, thank you. Mount Avery Baptist Church, thank you. Sanford Cloud, Sandy, thank you. Margaret Picercelli, thank you. The Phillips Metropolitan CME Church, thank you. Sanctuary of Faith and Glory, thank you. Shiloh Baptist Church, thank you. Congregational Church of South Glastonbury, especially uh, Reverend Allen, thank you. Reverend Dr. Alvan Johnson, not only do you teach, but you give to us, thank you. Reverend Dr. Kelly Littlejohn, thank you. Reverend Himi Budu Shannon, thank you. The Ruth Connett Trust Fund that gives us so much all the time, thank you. There are so many here I could keep naming. I just want you to know that we are so thankful for your support. This is a big initiative. We have dreamed big. Please join us in our mission with a gift. Please reach out to me personally. My email address is jlor at hartfordinternational.edu. I'm happy to speak to you directly. It is such an honor to do this work to be here with you and to do this work in God's service. Thank you for joining us. Again, as we close, we will hear from Reverend Wayne Dixon and some beautiful music. Thank you for joining us.
into Capra. Into 